Welcome in, everybody. Ready to dive deep again. Today, it's a fascinating perspective on salvation someone sent our way, talking about the sheep, the elect, and eternal security. When the winds of change are blowing and the world seems out of hand, when the ground beneath us trembles and we struggle just to stand, there's a peace that calms the chaos, a truth that we can hold. That all of what is unfolding is in God's control. In God's now, before we really open this up. Yeah, I guess at the stage, right? Exactly. And it's important. Our job isn't to tell anyone what to believe here. Just unpack the ideas from these sources. That's right. Understand the ins and outs of this particular theological viewpoint. You know, because and let's be honest, whether you agree or disagree, just understanding different perspectives. Well, that never hurts. Right. So let's jump right in. Sheep, shepherds, this idea of a chosen flock. Where does all that even begin? Well, like a lot of theological concepts, it starts with a metaphor, right? Huh. This source really leans on Jesus's words in John 10, 14, 15, where he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. I lay down my life for the sheep. Okay, the shepherd metaphor, classic. But what makes it so central to this view of salvation specifically? It's all about this idea of a super personal relationship, you see. The shepherd knows each sheep, they trust him completely. That bond in this framework, it's how they understand the relationship between Christ and those who are saved, the elect, they're called. The elect, yeah, not a term you hear every day. So what's the basis for this idea of a select group chosen for salvation? Where do they get that from? They go straight to Ephesians 1.4 to 5, where Paul talks about God choosing his people before the foundation of the world. This whole idea of predestination, that God's choice is the ultimate deciding factor, it underpins this whole theological viewpoint, you could say. So if it's all predecided, no say for us humans then. That's the stance, yeah. They use John 10.11 again, Jesus saying, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It's to show salvation's not earned, it's already decided. Okay, now that's different from how a lot of Christians see Jesus' sacrifice, right? Most see it as this act of love for all humanity. How does the source square that with predestination then? Good point. That's a key distinction. This perspective, they don't diminish the love in Christ's sacrifice, but they argue it was specifically for the elect. Meaning? It wasn't offered to everyone hoping for a response, but made because they were already chosen, you see. Whoa, okay, heavy stuff. And it kind of leads to the next big question, right? If it's only for a select few, what happens to everyone else, the non-elect, so to speak? Things get even more, let's say, complex there. They use this phrase, passing over, to describe it, citing Romans 1.2426, where it talks about God giving them up to their desires. So just so we're clear, God's not actively condemning anyone, but he's not extending his grace either, kind of letting them face the consequences of their own actions. Is that it? That's how they present it, and they link this to Romans 3.011, none is righteous, no, not one. Their argument is humanity is inherently flawed, so God's just in choosing where his grace goes. Which, of course, raises questions about free will, right? If God's already chosen, where does that leave our ability to choose him? Does it even exist in this framework? Ooh, that's a question with a long history, theological debate for centuries there. We could do a whole nother deep dive just on that one. Huh, another time maybe. But sticking with these sources for now, this pre-selection, it's laying the groundwork for their idea of eternal security for those chosen, isn't it? Exactly, and to them, that security is absolute, unshakable. They point to John 10.2829, Jesus saying, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So once you're in, you're in. No backsliding, no doubts, no matter what. Bold statement. That's the core of it, yeah. It's an unbreakable promise rooted in God's power, they'd say. Even bring up Philippians 1.6, Paul saying, He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The source really emphasizes it's God who starts salvation, but also God who finishes it. So for someone who believes this, where does that leave them, practically speaking? What's the impact of this once saved, always saved on your life? The source says it should bring immense comfort, assurance. Knowing your place in eternity, it frees you from striving for salvation, mm -hmm. lets you focus on reflecting God's love, his grace in your life. A sort of liberation then through this predetermined path, but and I'm just playing devil's advocate here, some might say that leads to complacency, right? If actions don't affect your final destination, why bother with a moral life even? A common critique, for sure. But the source says true faith. It naturally produces good works anyway. It's not about earning salvation, but reflecting its power in you. 
So more organic than calculated then. They're building towards a very particular view of a believer's life here, aren't they? Without a doubt. And eternal security, that's mm -hmm. key to it. They believe it's ironclad, like we said, mm -hmm. citing verses like, you know, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. From John, that's unwavering proof to them. So no matter what a person does, if they're chosen, it's guaranteed. What are the implications of that, you know, good and bad, living with that kind of certainty? The source highlights the positive. It's peace, comfort, knowing it's secure, not dependent on your flawed efforts. That can be freeing, let you face anything with courage, with hope. Powerful motivator, I can see that, especially in tough times. But what about the flip side? Doesn't this unwavering security, could that lead to a lack of accountability? Another common criticism, yeah. Some argue it could lead to moral license. If your fate's sealed, why worry about your behavior? And how's the source address that? They say true believers, those genuinely changed by God, they wouldn't use this as an excuse to be reckless. Authentic faith makes you want to please God, not abandon morality. Inward change, guiding outward action, it's all circling back to God's grace for them, especially through Christ's sacrifice, isn't it? Exactly. And that's where substitutionary atonement comes in. Yeah. That sacrifice, it was intended for the elect, a deliberate act, to pay their specific sin debt. Right. Not for everyone, but targeted at the chosen few. How do they square that with a loving, merciful God, though? Seems kind of exclusive, doesn't it? They'd say it's not exclusion, but God's right to choose. Like a parent can love different kids differently based on their needs. God can extend grace, how he sees fit, aligning with his plan, his wisdom. So different understanding of love than we might think of, not bound by fairness or equality like humans see it. Definitely thought provoking stuff. It really is. Yeah. And, you know, even thinking about it more, this idea of passing over the non-elect, that's going to be the toughest part to wrap your head around, right? Even within Christianity. Yeah, for sure. Talking about sheep and shepherds is one thing, but God choosing some and not others... That's hard to swallow for a lot of folks. What are some of the counter arguments to this, even from, you know, similar theological traditions? Right. It's a huge point of debate. Yeah. Some people argue that using verses like Romans 1.2426 to support this kind of predestination, it's taking them out of context. Mm. They say giving them up is more about God letting humans have their free will to choose him or not, not this predetermined exclusion thing. So different interpretations of the same text. And free will seems to be the big sticking point, huh? If God's already chosen, where does that leave human choice? How does this source even try to reconcile those two ideas? It's a balancing act, no doubt. The source, they don't really dive deep into solving that tension. They say, yeah, we have free will, but it comes second to God's will, you know? Right. Even our choices, they're part of his plan, ultimately. Okay, so a, a bit of a mystery there. And I imagine this has huge implications not just for how you see your own salvation but your whole outlook on life right mm -hmm. if you believe you're secure how does that change things million dollar question the source they say this assurance of eternal security it should lead to a life of gratitude of serving god knowing your place in eternity it frees you from that burden of striving for salvation lets you focus on reflecting his love and grace so freedom through this predetermined path, but you could see how someone might say, well, doesn't that lead to complacency? If your actions don't change your final destination, why bother being good? Right. Another common critique. Their counter argument is that true faith, it just naturally produces good works anyway. It's not about earning your way in, but about showing the change that God's grace makes in your life. So more organic, less calculated. This source is really painting a specific picture of a believer's life here, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. And eternal security is central to that. Remember, there's certain, it's unbreakable. Citing those verses, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. That's absolute proof in their eyes. So no matter what you do, if you're chosen, you're good. What's it like to live with that kind of certainty, good and bad? They focus on the positive side, the peace, the comfort of knowing it's settled, not relying on our own messed up efforts. That can be incredibly powerful, especially when things are tough. I bet, yeah. But the other side of that coin, doesn't this unwavering security, could it make people feel like they're off the hook for their actions? A common concern. Some people say, yeah, it could lead to this moral license thing. If your fate's sealed, why even try to be good? What's a source say to that? They say true believers, those truly changed by God, they wouldn't use this as an excuse. Genuine faith makes you want to live right, not abandon your morals. It's about inner change driving outward actions. It always comes back to God's grace with them, especially through Christ's sacrifice. Exactly. That's where substitutionary atonement is so important. That sacrifice, it was meant for the elect specifically to pay their sin debt. Not for everyone, just them. 
How does that square with a loving, merciful God, though? It seems kind of exclusive, no? They'd say it's not about exclusion, but God's right to choose. Like, a parent can love different children in different ways, depending mm -hmm. on what they need, right? God can give his grace how he sees fit, in line with his plan. So a different way of understanding God's love, not necessarily bound by our human ideas of fairness or equality, really makes you think. It really does make you think, huh? And, you know, going through all this, it makes you realize this view of salvation, it doesn't just affect how you see God, but how you see other people too, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It makes you question all these big ideas, fairness, free will, even what God's love really means. And yeah, it definitely changes how you approach things like evangelism, how you talk to people with different beliefs. Right. Like if you believe God's already decided who's saved, what's the point of even sharing your faith? Why bother if it's a done deal? Yeah, that's a big one this view has to wrestle with. Some would say, if God's choice is final, there's no need for evangelism. But others might say, it's about obedience, playing your part in God's plan, even if you don't get it. So less about convincing, more about just living your truth. It seems like even within this system, there's room for different takes. Exactly. And then there's the question of, okay, how do you get along with people who believe something totally different? When the core of your faith seems so far apart. Gotta be tough to find common ground when you're starting from such different places. Does this source, do they say anything about how to talk to people who disagree? They talk about sharing your faith humbly, respectfully. It's not about winning arguments, but planting seeds, you know, and being understanding, giving grace, because everyone's on their own path. So focus on the journey, not just the destination. It's interesting, this view. It's complicated, maybe even divisive, but it also kind of forces you to look inward a bit, don't you think? 100%. This whole deep dive, it shows how this isn't just a set of rules, but a whole way of seeing yourself, your relationship with God, your place in everything. And whether you buy into it or not, just wrestling with these questions, that's got to be valuable, right? It makes you think about faith, about grace, about what it means to be chosen in the first place. Totally agree. Just engaging with these ideas, even if they challenge you, it can help you grow, help you understand your own faith better. Exactly. And that, at the end of the day, that's what we're all about here, right? Exploring different ideas, understanding each other better, having those aha moments that make these big topics click. Couldn't have said it better myself. Asking the tough questions, digging into the nitty gritty, and coming away with a bigger, more complete picture of faith and how people see it. Amen to that. Big thanks to everyone tuning in for this deep dive, exploring this honestly fascinating and thought-provoking view on salvation. We hope it's given you plenty to chew on as you continue your own journey of faith.